This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Hello and welcome to When All This Is Over, a special Straits Times podcast brought to you by the National Arts Council. To inspire and uplift readers as the country emerges from the COVID-19 circuit breaker, we asked 20 local writers to come up with poetry and prose about the pandemic and what it will be like when all this is over. We will be releasing these over the next few weeks. This is the third of a four-part series. Mast by Verena Tay. To release her building migraine, Melissa instinctively massaged her head. When her fingers met the mask loops behind her ears, she groaned, remembering the rules of hygiene. There was no time to wash her hands properly yet again. She squirted cold alcohol from the sanitizer bottle on her desk and rubbed her hands clean. The children were now having their tea break, 20 clear minutes for her to focus on the most pressing paperwork. They were one person down today at the childcare centre. Sophie had called in earlier to say she had a doctor's appointment. That meant that Melissa had to help the teachers out instead of doing admin. Melissa prayed earnestly. It was Sophie's pregnancy that needed medical attention and nothing else. God forbid she had come down with COVID-19. There would be more headaches if the centre were to be closed down and cleaned, and both staff and children had to enter quarantine. As she scanned her email, Melissa hoped for no latest government directives in her inbox that would make running a childcare centre even tougher. Her throat itched. She coughed and grabbed her mug for a sip of coffee to ease the strain. She was out of practice. When she was a mere teacher, she could last a day with the children and her voice would not hurt. Just after two hours, her throat was already scratchy. Was she too tense nowadays? Or was it because of the mask across her face? Breathing and speaking together through layers of cloth was so difficult. Outside her office, one child bawled, then another. Melissa rose to investigate. Entering the dining area, she called out, What happened? At one table, there was spilt milk, overturned plates, a tattered mask, and two sobbing boys, each being consoled by a teacher. The rest of the children were motionless and silent, their eyes shut above face masks or behind face shields, not heeding the other teacher's efforts to usher them away. Melissa sat down, took the crying, maskless child into her lap and comforted him. There, there, Sonil, everything's okay. We can sort this all out. No need to cry. Slowly, it transpired that everyone was jealous of Sonil's new face mask, handmade from an Avengers print cloth. When the children had unmasked to eat and drink, Jason had somehow got hold of Sonil's mask and would not let go. A fight had ensued and the mask had been torn. Melissa did not know whether to laugh or cry herself. She had entered the field of early childhood education because she loved to see the happy faces of children every day. Post-circuit breaker, she was heartbroken, having to coax her charges to cover their noses and mouths for long periods. Ah, the absurdity. Previously, the girls attending the centre would squabble over who had the nicest frozen school bag. Now, must she and the teachers deal with mask envy as well? Melissa sighed. There would be time to reflect later. First, tempers must be soothed. Then Jason must be reasoned with. Sunil supplied with a new disposable mask and a consolation balloon. Parents notified and a hundred other tasks to be completed. By the end of the day, Melissa's migraine was massive. Until all the children left for home and the center was cleaned, she could not focus on the pain. As parents dribbled in to collect their children, she smiled behind her mask while waving and saying goodbye to her charges. Before he left with his mother, Sonil tottered up to Melissa, his purple balloon popping up and down beside him on its string. He gave her a huge hug around her hips and whispered through his mask, Thank you. Then off he ran to join his mother, waiting by the centre's main door. Melissa's heart leapt, and she kept it high, refusing to heed her teacher's instinct to correct his pronunciation. After all, with her face mask on, 
how easy would it be to show a child the difference between saying t and th? Memories are water shaped as stories, by Firoz Ahmad. We will remember what we want to remember, and we will forget what we want to forget. No, we will not forget what we want to forget. We shape them to what they need to be. Memories are water shaped as stories. Force hits water. Words are displaced, wet. Some words are drenched. The lazier words float on water, pulled by the wind. Seabirds swoop and peck at them. They let the birds be. These are happy-go-lucky words. These are take-it-easy words. Heavier words sink so deep that it is impossible to decipher what words these are, what memories they are made of. Don't bother, they say. It is too deep. It is too dangerous to go below. Let them be. Tend to the easy ones, mostly the floating words. These are easy pickings. Then. Tend to the ones only moist at the sides, if need be the drenched ones. That is all. These words, these words, they are okay. So we scoop up these memories and drink from the wetness of our hands. The water tastes of absence. Some words slip through the valley of our fingers because we are callous. We are thinking of other words. Be gentle. Be present. Even better, let a child scoop them up for you. They are gentler than you. They are always present. They have small fingers. No words can escape. Why were you thinking of other words? I was thinking of the words deep down below. I can still remember them. They must be dredged. Dredging is dangerous work. You can get cut or drown. I know. Do you know what the deepest part of the ocean is named? Hadal, hell. It is the coldest. But you dived in. Because you are a fool, and they were right. It was too deep, too dangerous. We are all fools. It was safer to be at the surface. You should have been like the others. The rest are hanging the damn words to dry now. See, some of them are already good as new, especially the ones floating on water. All trawled at one go. They do not resist. These are happy-go-lucky words. These are take-it-easy words. You reach the surface and, like fishermen of old, haul up your net. A thick ball of seashells, weeds, shards, sand, and words, all wrapped in colors. Such a shame to break it. But you are wiser now. You tell yourself, color is the fiction of light. And so you reach out for a knife, feel the touch of blade on skin and stab. Words spilled on earth. You stab it each night when your heart is empty, and your heart is full again the next morning. This will happen again and again. It is the price to pay for going too deep. And so, over time, all memories become stories. It is the only way that water flows. Once upon a time, long before you were born, I spent the entire Ramadan alone in my room, for all the mosques were closed. I prayed each night. It did not feel the same. Was this in the 18th century, Grandpa? during a time of war and wicked witches? No. Let me tell you the tale. There once lived an old man who stayed home alone for fifty-eight nights. He grew a beard so long that it stretched from end to end. On the seventh night, he forgot if he had washed his hands. On the twelfth night, he forgot who his family was. He only remembered dreams. It was a dark and stormy night when she got the news that her mother had passed away. She could not attend the funeral because we defend our stories and the flows they take in our hearts. Like the kings of the past, we draw swords and we draw shields to protect them because they matter and because they are worth defending. We have felt defeat. We are all fools. We are all kings. Going Round in Circuits by Jennifer Ann Champion When friends and lovers meet, unmasked in the street, a spectre slips its hand between hands held till it's over. All men congregate at round tables once more, between sips of beer, counting who is still here, over. 
WhatsApp and group chat, advice pours like blessing. Fear doesn't blow over until it's all over. Coated in regards, we return to the grind, if there even is a grind to tide us over. Us and our flood, a recurring pandemic. The otters and the birds and the fish know it's over. She won't want to say they asked over time of her. It's great that her Sundays off at home are now over. He'll still be isolated from the country he built. The poet inside him welding words over and over. When we ask if happy ever after really has resumed, we discover none of it's over until it's all over. The Children by Yumei Balasingam Chao After eight months, her children were coming home. They were rotating between services, her son from military to healthcare, her daughter from healthcare to construction, and their medical reports were clear, so they could spend one weekend with immediate family before the next posting. She had to be tested too, to confirm that she didn't have the virus. There were still inexplicable community outbreaks, and no vaccine or reliable treatment. She was relieved to get a negative result. It meant she could hold her twins again, not just talk to a screen or send haptic emoji, which simulated affection but felt like sandfly bites on her skin. The children arrived on Friday, whipping off masks and gloves to hug her. They were muskier, leaner, louder. On video calls, they had let her mother them. Are you eating enough? Is there enough protective gear? So many rumours. Also about shortages of rice and filtration tablets. Now she realised they were adults with their own views of the world. At dinner, her son said, Remember M, the one we called Teacher's Pet? So our ship surrounded the small motorboats. They were trying to enter our waters. Our commander told us to stop them. M started arguing with him. He scoffed. You know all those people have the virus. That's why they want to sneak in. And M wanted to let them. We're doing national service for Singaporeans, not for them. How did you stop them? She asked. He shoveled food into his mouth. Both children were eating furiously. They did so at every meal that weekend, driven by something more than hunger or comfort. On Saturday, she said, Take your time, no rush. Her daughter said, The virus doesn't wait. It strikes once it has the chance. If we slow down, it'll spread even faster. Remember that, she said to her brother. There's a new wave of cases at your hospital. It's going to be full on, lots of tough choices. No mercy. Her daughter sounded like the government officials she had seen in the news. Where did they learn to talk like that, she wondered. What choices had her daughter made? After eating, the twins roamed the flat, helping with housework, asking about her job. She remote operated a machine at a factory making medical grade test tubes, and her friends. She saw them once a month, when it was safe in the virus's replication cycle to meet in person. Later, they went into a room and closed the door. She thought she heard angry crying. It was a new sound. At their father's death and after, they had wept but gently. She remembered cradling them, one in each arm after they were born. When they got heavier and she had to use both arms for one baby, the virus seemed far away then. It wouldn't take him until the twins were four years old. And she thought, if I get through this, I'll teach my children everything they need to know. It was not enough, she could see now. What they had to do, day after day, in the name of the nation's survival. And if they caught the virus, or were injured, or died in a service mishap, the terror kept her up that night as it had before. She heard crying again. Her eyes were painful, but dry. On Sunday morning, when the children stumbled out of their rooms, she had cooked all the food in the refrigerator, enough for a week. Her daughter said, Are you feeling okay? Her son took her temperature. It was normal. They ate quietly and industriously for the rest of the day. She wondered what the food was turning to inside their bodies. Strength, wisdom, protection. If only it were that easy. In sunset, her daughter said, Sorry we can't stay. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. I want to eat, her son said. I want to sleep in my own bed. At least I don't have to carry a rifle anymore. 
You learn to read medical charts, her daughter said. A gun is more direct. Her son looked as ill as she had felt all day. At the door, they were about to put on masks and gloves when she circled them with her arms, one twin on each side. They were taller than her husband had been. She ached for the absence of them. Then they were gone, down the stairs, sprinting for the bus. When she looked down over the parapet, dark figures were running in the same direction. She couldn't tell which ones were her children. Let the Morning In by Felix Cheong Time is still even if clocks move You go through days in the same old groove You look like life, but you are dead You may smile, but nothing is said So let the morning in Doesn't matter Thank you for listening to When All This Is Over, a special Straits Times podcast brought to you by the National Arts Council. For more local digital arts offerings, visit alist.sg to appreciate hashtag SG Culture Anywhere. That was an SBH podcast by the Straits Times. Find us on Spotify, Apple or Google Podcasts or streaming on Google Home. Do feedback to us at podcast.sbh.com.sg. You can also check out more podcasts on various topics at The Straits Times, The Business Times and Money FM 89.3.